Hi, my name is Janelle Riley. I'm an editor at Variety and welcome to this SAG After a Foundation conversation at home with Jeremy Strong of Succession. Uh, in addition to playing troubled son Kendall Roy on that series, today's guest has appeared in such films as Selma, The Big Short, uh, for which he was nominated for a SAG Award as a member of the ensemble. Um, perhaps most impressively, he was last year's hot Halloween costume. Please welcome Jeremy Strong. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you. Um, yes, I went as you for Halloween, and I was... Um, no. Oh, well, I'm so honored. <laughs> but I wasn't the only one. There were so many Kendalls on, uh, that I saw online. That, that I don't know if you were aware of that or not. I, 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 you know, people sent me pictures, and, you know, it, it was... Um, uh, to say the least, sort of uh, uh, strange and and you know and, and I guess an indication of of um, you know how the show has sort of penetrated, uh, reached audiences and 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 so I you know I never I I never thought I would get to make it to the pantheon of Halloween characters. So I'm very uh, it's very gratifying. <laughs> I don't really jump right in like this, but it was yeah. probably the most talked about scene of the year, um, Kendall rapping at his father's birthday celebration. Uh, I think you deserve a Grammy, frankly, for that performance. <laughs> what was it like when you read it in the script, or did someone give you a heads up it was happening? We, we were doing the table read in Glasgow, and uh, I got to the point where we're at the V&A in Dundee, where we have this big event celebrating my father 50 years in business. And, uh, and Jesse had, had written one lyric that was like, you know, like a, like a kid at a bar mitzvah doing a bad rap. And, and, I, and I said, uh, yo, MC, kick it. And, you know, and I, and I sort of, I went up to Jesse after the table read and, and sort of uh, 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 vehemently advocated cutting the whole thing. Um, and, you know, and as we do, because we have a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly blessed to have a collaborator like Jesse, who really, um, who really listens to his actors and who allows us a sense of ownership uh, uh, of the characters. And so, and we have a healthy and often combative uh, uh, sort of creative uh, um, dialogue and and he said well you know give me a chance I, Nick Brattel our composer is gonna is gonna send you something he's working on an actual rap and a beat and you know and and and, uh, and then he sent me a video of a guy uh, who's a sort of um, billionaire oil heir and there was an Instagram video of he and Nelly going up at his 40th birthday party and rapping on stage. And this guy is sort of rapping with conviction. And there's something about it, you know, the sort of uh, the trying too hard of it uh, that just felt like it lived in the place that the show lives. And then Nick called me on the phone that night and, and, and uh, did the rap for me over the phone. Um, and so then it became, uh, then it became sort of, a fait accompli, and 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 I knew I had to commit to it, and and you know, and try and try and make it work. Um, but it was, you know, it, it was one of those things like this show. You never know what they're going to throw at you, especially I think for me, uh, because they have put me through the ringer in all sorts of sort of e e extreme ways, um, and that's also the great joy of it as an actor, because that's what you. You know that's that's what you want, um, and so uh, yeah, it was it was just a it was it was sort of thrilling and and terrifying, and you know I've never I've never rapped before, and um, not even in private. And I, and I, you know, although I love rap music, I listen to a lot of I listen to a lot of hip hop, I listen to a lot of rap, I listen to a lot of classical, and Nick had taken this uh, uh, this this um, Bach partita and kind of, you know, done something with it to make it into a beat. And, you know, we start the whole series with me in the backseat of my Maybach listening to the Beastie Boys. And it felt like a real, um, 
you know, marker in terms of how much distance we traveled and, and, and with the character. Um, and so, you know, because it's television and because we're on, you know, that you're sort of putting the, the plane together as you're, as you're flying it. Um, I only had, I think, a few days. And so I just sort of drilled it and tried to really internalize it and, and also save it. I'm a big believer in, in kind of making yourself go out on the limb whenever possible, whenever you can kind of walk the plank, whatever that means to you. I think when you, when you sort of wager something like that, um, it can lead to, it can lead to good moments. Um, so I didn't want to do it out loud and I didn't want to rehearse it and I didn't want anyone to see it until we shot it on the, on the night. Uh, so that was, that was great because we, we had, I think four cameras. Uh, so, so it enabled us to shoot it in a way that it was live and everyone's reaction was a true reaction. And, um, you know, it was, yeah. I mean, I certainly found myself thinking, you know, uh, uh, how did I end up here? Um, but it, but it, it was, it was great. It was a, it was a real sort of, uh, um, it felt like another sort of liminal experience where I get to go to, 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 you know, kind of, you get a chance to break your own like sound barrier. Uh, when you said that you- And the costume, you know, that you wear, I do have to say, I do have to take credit for, uh, uh, you know, I did a lot of sort of quick research to try and figure out how to how to do that and look at behavior and look at raps and and so I decided that I have to have a jersey of some kind and so I sketched something on like a, a hotel stationery and sent it over to Michelle Matlin, our brilliant costume designer. And like two days later, uh, we got a bunch of jerseys in 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 Scotland. So that's the kind of show it is. It's a it's a it's a really uh, a fantastic sort of um, you know uh, uh, alchemy of, of of all the different uh, sort of creative voices. By the way, that font on the jersey didn't exist. Like my friend had to hand draw it and cut it out. Like it was it was one of the most expensive and labor intensive costumes I've ever had. And uh, and now it exists. Now now you can find that font. I think they should name it after you. Thank you. <laughs> when, when you said that you uh, immediately advocated uh, cutting it, was that out of, out of fear or, or, or just uh, discomfort? No, I think it was just that, you know, one of the interesting things about the show is sort of tonally where it lives. Because as you know, it's sort of, it, 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 it straddles a lot of different uh, tones. And I tend to feel that I'm in a, in a drama. And, and I often feel like my, my task is to sort of be the, the ballast of this sort of, you know, ship of, of misfits and crazies and, 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 um, and to anchor it and give it weight, the world of it, uh, through the character's struggle and embodying, you know, the, 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 the weight that Kendall is carrying. Um, and it felt like it possibly, you know, what is it from the sublime to the ridiculous is but a small step. It felt like we might be taking that step. Um, but, but at the same time, you know, and this is where Jesse's sort of brilliance is, it's one of his great virtues, is he really knows, um, how do I say it? You know, I heard, I heard Dustin Hoffman once talk about the about Jacques Cousteau and Jacques Cousteau said that the trick was in knowing how far to go too far mm. and I feel like Jesse knows how to do that without without going into the ridiculous he does go into the absurd and the show sort of lives and between the absurd and the painful um, but I think that this you know once I realized how we could do it it felt exactly how far to go too far. It felt yeah. like let's let's go a little too far. Um, but I, you know, I think I think I I think I advocated cutting it because I didn't want it to just be silly. Sure. Um, but then, but then, of course, he never intended it to be silly. He intended it to be uh, completely sincere, and 
And I did find in, in doing that scene, as you know, in, 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 the, in the second season, my character is a bit of a recessive presence uh, because he is so uh, collapsed in on himself and sort of has become uh, kind of fossilized inside, frozen and, and um, so there's a, so there's, so there's very little, it was a real challenge as an actor. There's very little active to do. And there was, it, it was all very internal. Um, and so that was one of the rare chances of doing something expressive. And, you know, it's funny the way rap kind of makes you feel is sort of the way Kendall, I think, feels inside. Uh, that expansiveness and that power and it allows you like acting to sort of put on a mask that frees you from your from your social self and Kendall spends so much time I think feeling small made to feel small by his father and feeling thwarted and feeling uh, undermined that actually that rap was very empowering and it was a way of saying I love you to my father um so you know yeah and you know actually brian we were we shot that i think at three in the morning oh. we were on nights and brian is uh you know he's older than i am and and he had i think five scenes to do the next day that that had been rewritten so i think he didn't want to stay for it um and so you know in 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 uh, you know, like in in line with the dynamics of our show, I was going to maybe do this rap to an empty seat, uh, uh, which I think would have also worked and would yeah. have fed me in a certain way. But I went up to him and I said, let, just let me do this once. Let me surprise you with this. And we did it. And I went over, I put the hat on him and, and you know, and then he stayed for the rest of the night. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was... It was, yeah, it was, it was a, it was, it was a great sort of creative puzzle to, to, to solve. And, 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 you know, with, it, with a big canvas like this, with sort of 10 hours of, of material, um, you get to have so many of those, you get to jump through so many sort of rings of fire. Um, it's funny because you're, you and your succession family came into uh, the sag After Foundation in September and we spoke then and already at that point, we were probably halfway through the season and Kendall had already been through a lot in that season. I thought there's, what, what more can they possibly put on this poor man's shoulders? Um, and then it turned out there was so much more. Uh, I'm sort of curious um, because some of your co-stars actually expressed concern for your, for your mental well-being playing this character. Are you the sort of person who takes your work home with you at the end of the day? I don't know. I mean, I guess so. I guess it, 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 it does kind of take over your life, I think. Um, I don't know how to do it otherwise. Um, at the same time, I think it's a game, you know? I mean, it, 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 it is a game and, and you try and deepen the game and I think really believe in it. So, so I don't think, um, listen, I think, I think that, that that six months of work was was very hard for me um, because I felt such a responsibility to the veracity of what he was experiencing, which which was, uh, and we may have talked about this when I when I saw you back in back in August. You know, Jesse and I had talked about crime and punishment before we started filming the season, and I had read it a long time ago, and I didn't really remember anything, so I reread it before we started and one of the things that really struck me was this description of the monstrous pain that Raskolnikov is carrying around inside of him because of what he's done. And it's a pain that he can't share with anyone. So it's, it's sort of a double pain because it's both the guilt of, of his sins, um, but it's also the pain of his aloneness. You know, Kendall is so alone uh um and and what he did in the end of season one with the boy it it separates him from who he was and you know he loses a part of himself and his humanity i think irrevocably 
And there's a kind of unbridgeable divide between him and everyone around him. So I guess I felt like I needed to experience that in a, in a, in a, as, 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 as rigorously as I could um, so that I might be able to understand it better and, and thereby embody it so that the audience can have a, a palpable you know, felt experience of it. Because as I say, so much of it was internal. You know, so much of it is just, you see Kendall sitting on the couch in a certain way. And, and, and from that, I think you need to understand what he's going through because there's not a lot in the season where we check in on, you know, on what's going on with him. We see him going through the motions and I think he's sort of on autopilot and he's, you know, just become uh, this sort of submissive, you know, he's sort of, he's thrown in the towel. He's given up on himself and on his life and decided he'll just kind of do his father's dirty work until the point where that work becomes uh, so dirty, so sort of monstrous, really, um, that, 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 shifts again um but so you know yeah i think i feel a need to to try and create the reality of that when we're at work and and i'm sure you know it was hard sort of i have two little i have two young girls i've got i've got i've got a two-year-old and, and a seven-month-old so my my two-year-old um was you know we i was with her at home and then i'd go to work and be on the on the you know 75th story of of a building out on the ledge um you know and so that that was that was a, a balancing act because i do think you have to uh when you're you know when you're like when you're when you're on the court when you're between the lines it has to be everything in the world. It has to matter more than anything in the world. So, um, so, so, it just so happened for me that the that the that the season existed in such a a kind of hellish place that the character is 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 trapped in. Um, and so, when we finished, you know, there was a few things. Iceland, where the episode where the season started, which was really just following what happened uh, in England at the wedding, um, you know, that, that was really a sort of anguished, needed to be an anguished time. And going to the boy's family's house with my father, that was really hard. You know, I didn't, I don't really know what my process is. I, I don't have a set anything. I sort of just follow my instincts, but I, that I was unprepared for how that was going to to hit me walking into that house and just the smells of the house and the and the sort of squalor of the wallpaper and the kitchen tiles and the pictures of the boy and again you know the process that we make this show I got to walk into that house for the first time with a camera on so then you just get to sort of have the experience and and have it be be witnessed on film um so it's 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 um but when i by the time we got to the rap kendall had reached a place where basically he had and jesse and i sort of threaded the needle of this quite closely together he had as people do you know the the the, the anguish of it had faded and he learns to accommodate himself to what happened and even maybe forget about it most of the time I think the, the part of the acting challenge was to make sure that it was always there um, as a sort of gorgon head, you know, staring in, into him, even whenever he starts to feel like he's ventured out of it, you know, and, and feeling okay again, um, just getting a flash of that. Uh, so it was, you know, it was, it was, yeah, it was, Listen, I guess I'll say I felt a great release when I was able to get out of that place. Um, yeah. 
Uh, I'm sort of curious because I, I don't think they give you, or maybe you do have discussions, um, you probably don't know where your character is going at the start of the season. And, and I'm sort of curious, because um, I went back and rewatched season two and sort of tried to pinpoint the moment where uh, I knew Kendall was going to make the choice he made at the end. Um, and I don't know if it's just when he feels betrayed by his father, because his father you know, makes him the, the blood sacrifice, but there's little things throughout where you see him sort of wanting to, to, to push up against that. Um, does Jesse sort of give you an overall character arc or do you sort of discover it as the scripts come? Yeah, I, you know, I always know what it's going to be. And I, you know, I hound him for it. <laughs> and he also has been very willing and, 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 and transparent with me. Um, so from the beginning, I, you know, we, we talk a fair amount and I have a sense, not in, a, in, not in terms of the minutia, but in terms of the overall arc of it and the broad strokes of it and I know where it's going to begin and you know I know where it where it will end um and I know sort of what the stations of the cross are going to be so I knew that the final scene of this season was going to be that reversal mm -hmm. and you know and like the first season I felt a tremendous sense of pressure in a way that the whole emotional dramatic architecture of the entire season rests on a single scene again um so and and i also knew that the audience had to not be able to see it coming um i think personally you know there's a way to wonder if there's a kind of kaiser soze-esque uh you know, master plan where he's kind of playing possum and you watch it and reverse engineer everything and he's waiting for his moment to, to you know, to strike. I don't think that that, that's not my interpretation. Uh, and, and, and I actually think that Kendall, until the almost very last moment, believes that he should be made a, a, a blood sacrifice to to atone uh for his for his crime um and his cowardice and his um you know his 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 sort of moral failure um and you know i think it's interesting because they it, it, my Logan uses that term blood sacrifice. And I guess I feel like that's the actor's job. You know, it's like, whatever you have to put yourself through, whatever it takes, your job is to make a sacrifice of yourself for the audience. Um, so it's not, it's not about you having some kind of, you know, uh, pleasant uh, experience, if that's not what the character is is going through um but but to get back to that i think i think there's the whole season is about penitence mm -hmm. um and kendall again is forced to cross all kinds of moral lines in service of his father and in in in, in a kind of as a penitent um and at a certain point i think in the scene on the boat with my dad, you know, when he says, you're not a killer. Uh, I think there's, there's something in that scene, which, which is not that line, by the way, because that, that's something that he said to me in the pilot, essentially, you know, he's, al he's, he's always said, it is a big dick competition and basically you don't have, you're not made of sterner stuff. Um, but the, 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 I think the revelation for Kendall is when his father says no real person involved, alluding to uh, the boy. Um, and that just, that just, crossed a line for me uh it's like i know my i knew my father is a bastard i know he's a monster i don't know until that moment that he is maybe evil and 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 that 
was I saw something in that moment that I can't unsee and that uh, in that moment hinges everything. Um, and I, and, and I decide that I'm not going to, you know, throw myself on the sword for, for him anymore. Um, and that was also, you know, that's something that came about in a rewrite. Jesse and I was kind of working on trying to figure out, like, I felt like the, the trigger was there and the firing pin was there, but it still needed a hammer as a catalyst to send me to do what I was going to do. And, you know, I was hanging out with Nick Braun, who plays Cousin Greg. And Nick was talking about all my sons. And the moment when, you know, he finds out that his father was complicit in, 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 in knowing about the faulty airplane parts. And it felt like that's what we needed. We needed a moment um, where, where something, you know, uh, uh, is revealed that changes the whole complexion of the situation. Um, and I sort of brought that up with Jesse and, you know, he molded over. And then maybe a week before we shot the scene, a, a rewrite came in and I think he had woken up at two in the morning and realized, you know, the boy, he had never invoked the boy. And that's when, with that, with that level of callousness and, and, and inhumanity. Um, so to me, that's, it, was, it was simply that. Wow, that's, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you didn't really know Jesse before this series, correct? No, not at all. You know, I mean, I knew his work some. I, and I had worked with McKay. Uh, um, and Adam is the person who really brought me into this. Uh, and I, you know, and I went in and met Jesse and, and I read for him. And, and I think, you know, it was interesting. It was one of those times where, you know, you're in an audition and Francine Maisler, who's, a, who's an amazing casting director and has been, you know, a, a good angel in my life. Um, there was another actor who was also, you know, testing for the part, who's a, who's a sort of lion-hearted actor. And, and I thought he was gonna get this job. Um, but something happened in the room where, you know, the text was a bit different. And Adam gave me an adjustment that was essentially about kind of loosening him up a bit, the character and, and, and even the idiom in which he speaks. And, and, and uh, so we just started, kind of started playing around with it. And then, and then, and then I think we sort of found something and, and I think we all felt kind of maybe this is, this is where the character lives. And so, you know, thank God I, uh, uh, got this job because I, I, I do feel like it's changed my life and it also has given me the chance to sort of be fully expressed as an actor, which is all any of us, I think, hope for in, in a piece of work. Was it always Kendall? Because I feel like you said you were initially kind of drawn towards Roman, but I don't know if it yeah. was for you to, as, as you... Yeah, read. you know, it's interesting. I was. I, I, when I first read the script, because I went to lunch at Adam's house, and he said, you know, I have this script. It's kind of like a King Lear meets the Murdochs, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, um, corporate entertainment world, uh, War of the Roses story. And, and, and I just want you to read it and tell me what role you want. And, and that'll be that. And and of course it never ends up that way. Um, and I said, and I read it and I, and I really was drawn to Roman because it's a flashy, it's a flashy part. And you know, I, I'm, I'm a character actor. I've always thought of myself as a character actor and, and, and the kind of work that I've always, I think admired the most is sort of chameleonic work where people are transformed and they disappear into their roles. Um, and, you know, this character of a kind of real bon vivant, you know, prick was something that I thought would be, would be really fun and different for me. Um, I ended up getting to do that in, in Aaron Sorkin's movie, Molly's Game, in a, in a kind of different way. So I got that out of my system. Um, but 
I, so I, I raised my hand for that part. And then I found out a month later that, that they'd given it to Kieran. And he said, and Adam said, you know, well, Jesse's thinking about you for the lead of the show. Uh, and he wants you to come in and, and read for it. And, you know, of course I, you know, that part had also really landed on me. Mm. I think I felt afraid of it because there's nowhere to hide uh, with Kendall. I, I knew that what it was gonna require as an actor was, was in a way no, no tricks, no embellishment, no embroidery, simply kind of coming from my center and like from the base of my spine. Um, and that is really the kind of acting that I've always wanted to do and, and, and the acting that moves me the most. Um, but it felt scary because it just felt like a different way of working, which was just about a kind of honesty um, without, you know, without getting to transform in some, in some way. Uh, you know, I like, like I, I, I just did the trial of the Chicago seven with Aaron back in the fall, which all of a sudden is sort of, you know, it's scarily relevant given our headlines right now. Um, but that was a role that is the kind of thing I've always wanted to do, which is, you know, a, a sort of guerrilla theater, you know, uh, hippie from 1968 with, with a different voice and a different appearance and a different sort of, you know, energy. Um, and so this, you know, yeah, Kendall feels like there's nowhere to hide. Um, but it, but, you know, it also, I think, you know, when, when I read something, I think you look for how is this character in trouble and, and what does this character need and how badly do they need it? You know, those are the real engines. And with Kendall, it's like, boy, is he in trouble? You know, he's in trouble in so many ways inside and outside and his need is oceanic he, you know he needs so much so it felt really infinite in terms of the the possibilities of the character but it also felt very daunting to me um yeah and uh, were you guys had you started work on the third season when uh no when occurred? oh okay so do, do you have any idea what's in store for him I mean, tell us everything that happens in season. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, no, you know, I I do. Um, I have some, I have some idea. You know, I have a, a, a kind of broad sense. I do think that the writers, you know, we were supposed to start filming in April, early April, and you know, given the pandemic and the world, I'm sure, and I, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm sure they're thinking about all of this and taking it on board. Uh, as I'm sure most writers and, you know, showrunners are doing right now uh, in terms of, you know, do you integrate this into to, to our, to our story world, which exists in the same universe as the audience? And do you use this as material to sort of lean into? Um, and so I think that there's might be a bit of like uh, recalibrating, but I, but I have a general sense of, of, of the shape of it. And, and also, you know, one thing I love is, you know, Jesse will send me articles or books that are not at, remotely about the world of our show or, for, you know, historical figures or historical periods, things that he's thinking about that are going to be sort of the, the well water that he's going to draw from. So in that sense, in a kind of characterological sense, I have a lot of, I know a lot about where the character is going to be for the third season. Um, and that kind of feels like all I need to know. If I can do all my work in terms of knowing who this Kendall is, you know, who is the Kendall that says, it's my turn, um, and finally comes into power, and what that's gonna maybe look like. And then, you know, as far as the storyline, that can just fall on me and I'm sort of ready to take it as it comes. 
Uh, speaking of the pandemic, I'm just sort of asking people during this time, um, you know, what's what's keeping you going creatively? Are there shows you're watching or things you're reading? I know you have like 12 movies coming out in the next year. <laughs> so you've been very busy. I, I, I imagine you're, you know, reading tons of scripts at this point. I'm reading some scripts. I'm, uh, you know, it's interesting. I think it's been, I think it's been a bit of a, of a, of a fallow period for me. Um, you know, I'm in Denmark. I'm in a little fishing village on the coast of Denmark, which is a very lucky place for, for, for me and my family to, to have, you know, sort of been uh, stranded. Um, but I've got two little kids under two. And so really, the creativity of this time has just been about my children. And, you know, we live next to a forest called the Troll Woods, this big birch forest and, and miles of sand dunes. And, uh, uh, and I've just been spending time with them. You know, because as, as you know, when you're an actor and you work, uh, you're, you're away a lot, or you're sort of half there and half somewhere else. And so this has been a, a real gift in terms of an opportunity to be really fully here with my family. Um, and yeah, and I'm reading a lot of scripts and, and there's, a, there's, there's, there's a few things that I'm sort of actively uh, working on and putting together that I'm really excited about. But it, it has, I think for all of us, asked the question of what kind of work, you know, cause we all had a moment I think where we were really facing the possible loss of our world you know where we were like how how much is this going to go sideways and where is this going to land i think we still feel that in america in a sense of how how bad is this going to get before before it gets better um but i i think it has made everyone sort of take stock of what matters to them and what's essential and and Certainly for me, it's made me think about what kind of stories I want to be part of, uh, part of and, and what kind of stories I want to serve. You know, I, I feel very proud that, that I've gotten to be part of Selma and Detroit and The Trial of Chicago 7, which are all movies about that period in time. You know, Detroit being in 1967 and those riots and and Chicago 7 being in 1968 and 1969. And, you know, those are the kind of films I've always wanted to, to do. Um, and, and, and I think Succession, in a way, belongs in a, in a place of, of shows that are able to, to speak to the, the kind of, you know, the, 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 the maladies that are afflicting us as a, as a world and as a, as a society. Um, because it, it, it's not, it's not really an indictment of, 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 of the Roy family, but it is, I think, an examination of, you know, the, the, the kind of moral rot, um, that, that is so, that permeates so much of this, of the, you know, structure of our country and the world and is connected to why things are falling apart uh, right now. Um, and to our, you know, the moral rot that, that is in the leadership position in, our, in, in America. Um, so it feels like a way uh, through exploring these, these, very, these very specific individual characters on a human, in a human way um, of, of getting at a larger story uh that that you know so it's so it's epic in that sense um but yeah no i think you know i'm kind of i heard what i i heard someone i think i read it somewhere that when the fisherman is not at sea he mends his nets and i feel like we're all kind of having a chance to do that right now before we cast back out to sea um i'm very excited to go back to work whenever that might be you know i don't know when I know HBO is planning, you know, as soon as it's safe and as soon as it's possible, we'll, we'll, we'll be shooting again. And I think that will be soon. Um, but, you know, this has changed all of us in ways that I don't think, I think we're still too in the middle of it to understand. Um, 
but I know going back to work, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a different person after this experience. Well, I, d I don't want to rush anyone, but um, I really do hope you guys get back soon because I need that third season like like soon. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I want to remind everyone watching at home, you can find information on sag After Foundation's COVID-19 Relief Fund in the comments. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I look forward to everything you have going this year. Um, Thanks, thank you so much for being here.